Great. Um, well, such a delight to have all of you here. And, um, and yes, this is very much a personal engagement um, that then turned into an academic engagement, which then turned back into a kind of personal and academic engagement. Um, it's uh, it's it's a book that very much speaks to a particular moment and in Venezuelan history, but that also directly alludes to the present moment. Um, as you as you know, or perhaps you you don't know, but Venezuela is very much mired in crisis and controversy, and it has been um, certainly for the last 10, 15 years during the presidency of uh, of Hugo Chavez. Um, you know, it's ardent supporters, ardent opponents of the government of, of Hugo Chavez, and now his successor after he died in 2013, um, Nicolas Maduro, have really staked a place of uh, of highly of high polarization, in which, um, as I argue, uh, mentioned in the preface, um, really the first casualty of um, of polarization is history. Um, and this becomes an effort to reclaim a history as a way to try to mine some of that polarization or undermine some of that polarization, to see continuities where otherwise there are ruptures, um, which occasion the kind of hysterias that then lead to, um, uh, to lead, that lead to the, the dangerous um, uh, levels of polarization that we've seen. Um, but I also want to say that uh, the, the present moment in Venezuela, this, this crisis and controversy around the, the presidency of Chavez, is um, is quite novel, at least in the larger perception of Venezuela, um, which was seen for many decades before the rise of Hugo Chavez as largely a stable nation in an, um, a continent that was otherwise marked by civil wars and dictatorships from you know the southern cone all the way up to the to Central America. Um, and in that context, Venezuela seemed to stand apart. It was seen as exceptional. And the exception to the rule of um, uh, of misrule elsewhere was enlightened statesmen, um, uh, well-functioning multi-class political parties, um, a seemingly stable economy that was powered, of course, by oil, um, and the distribution of those rents in ways that assuaged rather than accessor um, uh, uh, um, exacerbated um, social tensions. Um, and this was largely the literature for decades until it collapsed um, in a way that um, caught many people who had upheld Venezuela as exceptional um, off guard. And um, in the wake of that collapse in the 90s and then the rise of, of Hugo Chavez, um, uh, what was striking to me as a, as, an, as a budding historian, as thinking about a project that um, had to do with, with this moment in time in Venezuela, was that the same methods that were deployed to um, cast Venezuela as exceptional now were being used to cast Venezuela in the opposite light, um, as uh, dysfunctional. Um, the the uh, the the, uh, the this enlightened statesmanship that was previously held as a reason for Venezuelan stability was now being held as the reason why leadership didn't transfer over in healthy ways, leading to a closing of the political system. Um, the uh, seemingly stable institutions that were previously as upheld as um, uh, uh, as as as, uh, as stable, guaranteeing stability, now were being seen as closed institutions that had no capacity to, to roll over, um, you know, to transfer over into, into a more democratic realm. Um, and the same economy that was seemingly providing the benefits of rents that people would um, uh, otherwise enjoy was now seen as the reason why Venezuelans were so um, riven economically um, and in a highly unequal society. Um, and so the same rubrics through which exceptionalism had risen were now the rubrics that were being analyzed um, in order to make a very different claim about the country. And so what struck me is that um, in order to ask the question of what happened, um, what, was ne what was necessary was to look elsewhere from institutions, leaderships, or political economic systems, especially economies. Um, how, and the, the question that I wanted to ask, what happened, but in a different register, was um, uh, what did people on the ground in the areas that were most directly affected by the changes in the political system from the period when democracy first um, is ushered in, in on January 23rd of 1958 until the crises moments, especially in uh, the Caracas of February of 1989, how did they understand democracy? Right? What does democracy look like on the ground? Um, and so this is 
uh, this is the genesis of the project, um, trying to answer this question of what happened in Venezuela by looking elsewhere, in particular urban popular sectors. Um, and to look at that, I wanted to find a place that would allow me to draw out this history in a way that um, uh, that was uh, uh, you know, that brought together the various components um, uh, that comprise the very riven urban political landscape, especially among popular sectors. Um, and uh, there's no better place to do this than the 23 de Enero, the January 23rd um, neighborhood. Um, which brings together a series of elements that I just want to describe here um, as a way to think about um, uh, the larger points that the book makes. Um, in terms of representing a particular current of uh, popular politics in Venezuela that, um, as I argue in the book, really becomes um, uh, the way through which we should understand popular democracy in Venezuela. Um, and this is just a small section of the 23 Senado neighborhood, but even here you can see some of the features that make this place, um, uh, uh, that make this place um, well, for the lack of a better word, exceptional, um, to think about this question that, I'm, uh, that I was posing. Just in terms of the layout of the of the landscape, you have what would uh, elsewhere in the region are um, you know uh, squatter settlements or favelas or barrios or villas, um, but at the same time you have these high rise super blocks, which elsewhere in the region are usually the hallmark or um, perceived as a as a hallmark of of middle class modernity, um, and yet here you have them existing side by side um, uh, in ways that um, uh, that uh, that. Uh, make the landscape itself, the built environment, quite um, quite heterogeneous. And I just want you to pay attention to this um, this arrow because that's where we're going to go to now. This is just a picture, uh, sort of a different image from that perspective that I was just pointing to, looking back to where we were. Um, and I just want to uh, point out in this particular image that the larger argument that I make in the book is encapsulated in this picture. Um, because what we see here is the interplay of the formal and the informal. And this interplay between formal structures represented in the superblocks um, that you see all around and the informal structures represented in the squatter settlements um, uh, is in fact a larger projection of the way that popular politics emerge in, emerges in Venezuela in, um, in the period after democratization in the late 1950s as the uh, combination, as this interaction between formal and informal um, politics, um, society, and economies. Um, there's another reason why this neighborhood becomes central to asking the question that I was posing which is that it's literally located at the center, the very heart of the uh, of Caracas, uh, the capital, but not just the heart of the physical heart of Caracas, the symbolic heart of the nation. It literally overlooks what used to be the defense ministry, which is also incidentally the place where currently Hugo Chavez is buried. Um, this is also um, a place that overlooks the uh, presidential par palace, Miraflores. Um, and it is also quite close to the national um, capitol building. Um, and this was no accident. It was purposely designed um, when it was first um, begun as a, as a housing project in the mid-1950s to represent the symbolic access axis um, linking together executive power, military power, legislative power, and popular power represented in these super blocks, which would be the entry point of popular sectors into modernity. So this, um, you know, this brings it uh, you know, very much at the heart of the nation. Um, it is also significant because of the name. Um, 23 de Enero is um, uh, 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 evocative of the date in 1958 when democracy was ushered in. But what's also significant is that this was not the first name of the neighborhood. Its primer, previous name was Dos de Diciembre, December 2nd, which was the date when the dictatorship that had ordered these super blocks built came to power. So it represented at the same time a regime um, that uh, sought to modernize the landscape and the people of Venezuela, but in doing so mined its own popularity. Um, and then quickly, just days after his overthrow, came to represent an entirely inchoate and different political project that was at least ostensibly perceived as democratic, right? But in both cases, it follows the sense of symbolic centrality, um, representing now two very different regimes. <laughs> And it's also significant because not only did it represent this initial military dictatorship, 
and its ambitions for Venezuela, and then came to represent the inchoate democratic ambitions of a new, uh, of a new political period. But in the era of Chavez, it came to again stand in as a center of um, the revolutionary aspirations of this new period. Um, here you see the, uh, the Jefatura Civil, the site of um, civilian power in the, in the neighborhood, and um, just a mural that says uh, 23 de Enero, Bastion of the Revolution. Um, and it's very much perceived in that light. This was the place where Chavez used to come to cast his ballots in elections that um, happened almost yearly throughout his presidency. This was a place where many of the social programs, the misiones that were um, became the, the linchpin of the Chavista political project that were piloted in the 23 de Enero before being rolled out nationwide. Um, this is a neighborhood that um, throughout the period of the Chavista presidency consistently had some of the highest electoral returns in favor of Chavez and Chavista candidates. Um, uh, so it was very much seen as a, a hotbed of support, as a cradle of, um, of, of, of the revolution. And yet, at the same time, this was also the epicenter for some significant expressions of dissent to the Chavista political project. And here's where um, I just want to uh, bring together the elements of sort of the political trajectory and the built environment that I was talking about before. Um, what you see here are two examples of this dissent that um, I'm expressing that happens in the context of an otherwise seeming support for the political project of Chavez. On the left hand side, you have um, uh, in the way, uh, uh, in the lead up to um, local elections in 2005, um, uh, Chavez imposed a series of candidates on the parish, on the neighborhood. Um, and this was very much seen by the uh, by organ social organizations, social movements in the neighborhood as a, um, as a betrayal of the larger promises of um, participatory democracy that they had been clamoring for for years. Um, and so in rejection of that measure by Chavez, they organized independently, autonomously, self-funded a series of local primary elections to among themselves choose who the candidates would be that would run for these local elections. Um, this was the first such example of local primary elections in Venezuelan history. Um, and they successfully were able to, you know, to put forward some candidates um, and run these elections. So this is one way in which the the, you know, dissent manifested itself. On the right-hand side, you have a very different expression of that dissent. This is, um, uh, for those who have been following Venezuela, um, one of the so-called colectivos. Um, these are armed um, uh, um, uh, self-defense groups who date back to the 1980s era of significant crime um, and drug, um, uh, 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 drug violence in the neighborhood, who rose up in the absence of state authority um, in the neighborhood to um, basically in, uh, perform vigilante duties. Um, and over time, they uh, incorporated an ideological vision into their project, but they have a significant amount of, um, of social purchase in the, in the neighborhood um, as a result of their longer history as a, um, as a, as a sort of self-defense mechanism for the community. And so in 2005, in the wake of the elections, the, the uh, elections that I was just mentioning, a Chavez, um, a Chavista candidate who won the mayorship of Caracas um, imposed a, uh, a, a jefe civil, uh, the, lar the highest civilian authority on the parish, and they organized to oust that imposed jefe civil and to put their own candidate, their own person in, com coming from the social movements, but a guy by the name of Mao, uh, not his actual name, um, but very very much uh, a Maoist. Um, but at the same time, that mayor also doubled down on support for the Metropolitan Police, which was the avowed enemy for decades of these self-defense groups who thought that when and with a Chavista mayor that the po Metropolitan Police would be disbanded. When they did not disband, um, they frontally attacked um, violently um, the, uh, the Metropolitan Police. and were successful in kicking them out of the neighborhood. Um, years later, the Metropolitan Police was disbanded, but it was in the 23 de Enero, in this violent way, um, that the, the first measures towards um, getting rid of this police force actually came. So what I want to suggest, and this is the argument that I make in the larger book, is that these two seemingly disparate expressions of dissent have a similar origin that coexist in a shared 
environment. On the one hand, you have a formal, legal, um, uh, um, institutional expression of dissent as represented in these primary elections and whose history goes back to a, a sense of attachment of the, the importance of the vote as the mechanism by which we gain a foothold of legitimate engagement with the state. This is the way through which we um, uh, have the the have an opportunity to seek accountability from the state through the vote. And yet on the left hand side, on the right hand side, you have an expression of informal, extra legal, non-institutional dissent whose trajectory comes from the sense that the vote is only the first step in seeking accountability from um, the state itself, right? That um, these formal and informal interactions are together through this broader spectrum of how we understand democratic engagement, what really characterize both the messiness but also the potential of popular politics and democracy in Venezuela. And it is no um, surprise that it emerges in a context where the built environment itself is an interplay of the formal and the informal. Right? And so the larger argument that the book makes is that these expressions of political power that come from and integrate with the formal and the informal, the vote and protest simultaneously, are also um, at the heart of how the neighborhood comes to look over the course of um, 30 and 40, year, 40 years that I cover from the late 1950s through the late 1990s. I think I'm going to leave it there. I'm so eager to hear the, the comments from Julie and Mark and Dorothy. Great. Thank you. I'm going to provide some brief comments, and then we'll hear from Mark and Julie. So there are a lot of wonderful things to say about this book. Um, as moderator, I'm only giving myself five minutes, so I'm going to focus on one thing in particular, which is the way that Alejandro characterizes the motivations both for mobilization and protest and relatedly for voting, voting behavior and voting decisions in democratic Venezuela. So in an essay related to the book, Alejandro puts this characterization very succinctly. He says that in democratic Venezuela, popular demands are generally made toward the state rather than against the state. Or in other words, popular demands are generally focusing on the performance of elected governments and not on the legitimacy of elected governments. Or to put the point another way, both mobilization and voting behavior have focused on um, specific policy changes or specific grievances rather than on supporting coup attempts or or even protests that have a kind of tone of coup mongering. So, Alejandro's original phrase in Spanish, I'm going to put up because it's it's really a lovely phrase and, and difficult to translate. In Spanish, this is that in Venezuela, popular demands are generally made ante el gobierno, no anti gobierno. Another way to try to translate this is that popular demands mobilization is focused on bad governance and not made against the government. Or again, focused on the performance of elected governments, not challenging the legitimacy of elected governments. So Alejandro provides decades of examples of this. And I just want to talk about a few that I found the most striking. So summer of 1958, this is about six months after the fall of the Paris Jimenez dictatorship. There's a transition government in place, and the country is looking towards presidential elections in December. This neighborhood and other neighborhoods of Caracas mobilize huge protests, large protests, against specific actions of the transition government. In particular, the substitution of a particular government official that these neighborhoods saw as an ally. These protests are so well organized, so effective, that the transition government is forced to reverse course and reinstate this government official. Nevertheless, one month later, these, the, the residents of these same neighborhoods that had mobilized massive protests against the actions of the transition government turn out in protests in support of that same government in the face of a coup attempt or, a, or rather a coup threat from within the military. Another example, in the 1960s, 
there are various guerrilla groups that are fighting the Venezuelan state, the Venezuelan democracy. And time and again, these guerrilla groups fail to mobilize residents of 23 de Enero, residents of other Caracas barrios, and their attempts to overthrow the elected government. Moreover, these guerrilla groups call on Venezuelan citizens to boycott the presidential elections and completely flouting those calls from guerrilla groups to abstain, these neighborhoods turn out to the polls en masse. Despite the fact that these same neighborhoods are very willing to, in that same December 1963 election, vote against the ruling coalition. So I think this is another example of what Alejandro describes as mobilization ante el gobierno, before the government, towards the government, but not anti-gobierno. My favorite example, December 1968, these same, na these same neighborhoods mm -hmm. <clears throat> vote in congressional elections for the candidacy or a party associated with former dictator Marcos Perez Jimenez and mobilize protests uh, against a court decision annulling his victory. These are the same neighborhoods that participated in ending the Paris Jimenez dictatorship just 10 years before. Now, I, I'm trying to recount this in a kind of calm, professional tone, but I have to say that this, this was one of the many moments I had when reading Alejandro's book that I was kind of looking at it open mouthed in my office, like, oh my God, you know, is anyone else reading this? This is incredible. And of course, I was alone in my office, so no one else was there to read it. <laughs> um, last example. So in 1989, 23 de Enero and, and other neighborhoods in Caracas participate in these massive protests related to a number of things, but um, <clears throat> one of them being economic policies of then President Carlos Andres Perez. And this event is in some ways the, the heart and a really powerful focus for Alejandro's book. Despite this, these same neighborhoods don't mobilize in a big way in support of uh, the Hugo Chavez's attempted coup against this same government just a few years later. But then again, when Chavez um, runs, participates in the democratic process as a presidential, as a candidate in the presidential election in 1998, many of these neighborhoods do vote for him. So in the less than one minute I have left, I want to talk a little bit about how this idea, this characterization that Alejandro has of mobilization and voting in democratic Venezuela relates to an election happening in Venezuela this Sunday. And let me preface this by saying, I, I don't think that history needs to directly inform current events in order to be relevant. I think just understanding the past is really valuable. But as Alejandro himself mentioned, the connections here in this case are just too tight to ignore. So I think there are a number of connections actually between the book and the election, but the one I want to focus on is asking whether the Venezuelan opposition, that is the opposition to the government of Nicolas Maduro, who's the successor of Hugo Chavez, understands Alejandro's characterization of protest and voting in Venezuela. Does this opposition understand that Venezuelans, or at least residents of these um, urban neighborhoods in Caracas, are more likely to mobilize about specific policy grievances rather than challenging government legitimacy. I think historically, uh, the answer has been no. That is, over the past 10 years, that Venezuelan opposition has kind of missed this point. Lately, I think there's um, some, some more signs that they're finally getting the message. I could talk about that a little bit. But there are other signs that, that the answer is no. And I just want to point to one in particular. Um, a very uh, v visible, prominent opposition leader posted a letter on Twitter saying that if the opposition gets the majority in the national, or rather when the opposition wins the majority in the National Assembly, their responsibility is not only to make democratic laws, but also to change the head of state, to remove Maduro from power. We can't wait for the 2019 presidential elections to do this. We have to instigate this change in the first half of 2016. And this is what I would say um, is a very anti-gobierno, not ante el gobierno message. So just in closing, I want to say that I think this book, and in particular this 
theory or argument or characterization of mobilization and voting behavior in Venezuela is really a great contribution, not only for us students of um, Latin American history and Venezuelan politics, but also for those who are involved in politics more directly. Thank you. Great, so now we're gonna hear from, from Mark Haley. 60 years ago tomorrow, this story began. Uh, when Venezuela's military dictator inaugurated the first buildings of what he proposed as the exemplary project of his new ideal for the nation. Velasco's book is a close examination of the political and social history over about a half century of that vast housing project located a stone's throw, as, as Velasco aptly puts it, from the presidential palace in Caracas. This community, El 23 de Enero, was founded as the model project of modernizing dictatorship then became the central site for the protest that overthrew it to establish a democracy. Taking its name from the day of the overthrow, it proved over the following decades a key testing ground for the promises and failures of, democ of democracy, as well as an enduring bastion of radical activism. In 1989, when social and economic crisis led the government to impose a harsh austerity program, the 23 de Enero was where protests began and where the brutal repression that would radically discredit the democratic regime took uh, its largest toll. Poor yet symbolically prominent, excluded yet politically active, the birthplace and graveyard of the country's fourth republic, this small city of several hundred thousand proves an excellent standpoint from which to view the growth of an urbanizing country and the political culture of democratic Venezuela. Just as it was a crucial laboratory for forging the often confrontational, sometimes violent, in many ways inadequate, but surprisingly resilient framework of democratic civil life, the protests ante el gobierno, but not anti-gobierno, so it proves a rich vein for exploring that civic life. Using a broad array of sources from oral histories to state archives, technical reports, and a deep reading in the popular press, Velasco weaves a compelling historical tapestry. This work stands at the confluence of three dynamic areas of scholarship, bringing them together with verve and advancing each in novel and compelling ways. So uh, at one point in uh, Velasco's narrative, a uh, frightened legislator or journalist refers to the 23 de Enero as a 45-headed hydra, mentioning it's 45 buildings. Um, I'm not going to make 45 points. I may make four or five <laughs> points. Um, and so uh, first a couple about uh, sort of situating this within broader studies of, uh, of urban history, of the social history of politics, and of the place of Venezuela in Latin America. Uh, and then I want to turn a little bit to uh, Velasco's method and the timing and framing of his overall study. First, Velasco makes a major contribution to the revived and again dynamic field of Latin American urban history. In the decade or so after the 23 de Enero was built, urban history in Latin America had its first flourishing as a high concept, theory driven, and often statistically based attempt to understand the challenges of a rapidly uh, urbanizing cont uh, continent. But this early scholarship had little space for social experience and was tightly connected to the technocratic visions of planners visions that began to fall apart on the ground and in scholarship by the early 1970s. The recent and powerful return of urban history has included a critical analysis of the processes in which early scholars were embedded as experts and advocates, taking on the lessons of a rich literature that emerged in other fields, notably anthropology and sociology, but testing them with a careful combination of archival research and oral history. Pioneering works, particularly for Brazil, have revealed a more, more complex history of urban struggles, tracing the rise of what James Holston has called insurgent citizenship in the shanty towns and housing projects of rapidly growing cities. Taking some cues from this literature, but reshaping it around his case, Velasco has produced a powerful new way of understanding housing, culture, and politics in Caracas. One particularly important contribution is his intricate work in recreating the way locals thought and felt about politics, democracy, and the city. By centering his account on this one sprawling complex, and by looking not at the history of isolated protest movements, but rather at the long-term construction of networks, ideas, and practices, Velasco takes our understanding of the political imagination of the urban poor far beyond the earlier work, works he builds on. Equally importantly, he grounds this understanding in a sophisticated grasp 
of the urban geography created by the overlapping logics of squatting, government slum clearance, and housing projects. This is a study so attentive to, as attentive to urban theory as it is to the specific dynamics of where community centers were built, how water and drainage systems worked, uh, what garbage distribution uh, networks, how garbage distribution was organized, and the role in political cultures of the long-term impact of differential access to housing when the projects were first occupied. How uh, the place where you ended up in the early months of 1958 shaped your understanding of the decades to come. Crucially, his study works both on the macro level at the moments like 1958, 1959, 1981, and 1989, when events within the 23 have decisive effects on national politics, and also on the micro level over a long period within this one large complex neighborhood. Second, his work is also an important extension of the large but uneven body of work on the social history of politics in Latin America. Over the past two decades, this scholarship has radically recast our understanding of Latin American democracy revealing both deeper veins of organizing from below and richer patterns of negotiation, co-optation, and contestation than more structuralist prior approaches had allowed. This scholarship has been especially rich for the 19th century countryside and the mid-20th century urban populist movements, but it is rarely extended beyond 1950, and it has only recently begun to connect up with those rethinking more recent social and urban history. It has hardly been explored in Venezuela at all, making this a particularly important innovation. Third, as already suggested, simply bringing Venezuela back into the broader Latin American conversation is a major advance. For 50 years, Venezuela seemed like an outlier as its democratic regime survived even as most of the continent succumbed to dictatorships like Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Peru, Bolivia, or brutal civil strife as in Colombia. This led to some sloppy assumptions about the institutional stability of the country and to a lack of interest in the everyday processes of social struggle and legitimacy that were well studied elsewhere. There were a handful of ex excellent national studies of policy, notably by political scientist Terry Carl, anthropologist Fernando Coronil, anthropologist Julie Skursky, uh, and two seminal ethnographies of the politics of urban planning by anthropologist Lisa Petty. But Venezuela saw little of the flourishing of community studies, oral histories, and rich social histories of politics produced elsewhere. Yet these social struggles were just as present and important in Venezuela as they were in other contexts, as Velasco reminds us, and they offer an especially rich vantage point on the meanings of democracy, this central concern of the book. In the key central chapters, for instance, he uses the history of organizing in the 23, in particular a garbage strike in the early 1980s, as a window onto how popular actors in the state thought about democracy, party politics, and social change in the city, and how those understandings uh, were transformed over time. From the insurrection of 1958, through guerrilla struggles in the 1960s, community organizing in the 1970s, and the protests of public services in the 1980s, he shows a complex process by which radical and partisan politics, formal and informal politics, together shape the neighborhood. This is a history of the civic imaginary behind often uncivil actions, a successful attempt to ground the local repertoire of contentious politics in everyday urban life and grassroots political imagination. Here then we have a fourth contribution. By exploring the political worlds of the urban poor in the decades before Chavez, Velasco provides crucial tools for understanding the experiences of the past 15 years. Tools that were hardly available to scholars uh, until now for reasons that have to do with this political history he's charting. It's worth emphasizing how much of the recent production around Chavismo, whether sympathetic or critical, imagines Venezuelan politics before 1958 as sorry, before 1998, as shaped entirely by elite actors and larger structures of political economy, especially oil. In this, as Velasco pointed out just now, uh, it remains a mirror image, it's a, a critical mirror image of uh, the more positive institutionalist uh, vision of before, but lacking in this broader social understanding. Even those understanding popular politics under Chavez uh, largely discount earlier popular politics or examine them through the discourse of a few guerrilla cadres or radicalized leaders. This has produced a flawed understanding of the larger course of Venezuelan politics and democracy, as well as a misjudgment of how and to what degree Chavismo has changed the country. Velasco's book offers an exemplary roadmap for understanding the past and the present of popular political struggle. Although the center of gravity of Barrio Rising is surely and rightly located before the era of Chavez, 
the book also casts the Chavez era in a new light, rethinking the experience of political mobilization in this bastion of Chavismo in a way that scholars and activists will be forced to reckon with uh, and ultimately carry further. So uh, I want to I want to read one quote uh, from the book. This is a little long, so bear with me. Uh, which is particularly at the beginning of what what as uh, Dorothy pointed out is a, an especially important, perhaps the central chapter of the book about the Caracaso. Uh, and Velasco is explaining why uh, he's taking the particular attempt uh, approach he does to the Caracaso. Um, so bear with me for a second, but I think it also speaks to. Uh, not only what he does in this specific case, but uh, his larger methodology. In the years after 1989, he writes, failed coups, presidential impeachments, and financial meltdowns exposed the institutional frailty of Venezuelan democracy, overtaking the Caracaso's significance as an independent indicator of systemic strain. Yet, the Caracaso's basic transcendental quality has continued to hold sway, thus identified as the representation of a rupture of a break. Thus identified, the Caracaso became an abstraction, a stand-in for the accumulated problems of the democratic system as a whole. Rendered and deployed as a device, the Caracaso lost its specificity. But that specificity is where the clues about why the Caracaso proved a turning point emerge. To focus more closely on the weeks-long event is to see the full dimensions of that fissure and to rethink the inevitability that came to be associated with it. Only by reconsidering the precise breakdown of pre-existing norms and expectations from both state and populace do the full implications of the Caracaso emerge. So these sentences uh, offer a model for how, although they're specifically about what he's doing with the Caracaso, they offer a model for how Velasco proceeds throughout, carefully taking apart symbols and singular moments, restoring stepping behind the, the symbols, behind a moment of what have been agreed upon as turning points in Venezuelan democracy, to explore them in greater depth and so bring them to light anew and show the kind of underpinning relationships and understandings that have been taken for granted uh, in or ignored entirely in previous uh, scholarships. So bringing these absent histories uh, or perhaps obscured histories uh, back to the fore uh, as a way of rethinking what this experience has meant as a whole. And one thing, uh, one other thing to, to say about that is the structure of the book. This is a book really that, to my mind, has kind of four overall pieces. Uh, a center, it's, it's opening chapters about the creation and occupation of the decisive beginning moment of this project in 1958, 1959. Uh, a second set of chapters about dissent and insurrection and the slow uh, course of guerrilla, in, of guerrilla struggles in the 1960s. A third set of chapters about protest, but also political incorporation and negotiation uh, in the 1970s and 1980s. And then finally, the rupture of this system uh, in 1989. So while some of the starkest scene and the sharpest writing come in the first and last of those moments, at the moments of origin and rupture, in the initial occupation of 1958 and the shattering of 1989, it's worth stressing, uh, as Alejandro did in his remarks, how important his treatment of the other two moments is for the overall argument and especially his convincing, if slightly counterintuitive, claim that it was the intensity of protest, particularly the intensity of community protest in the 1980s, that cemented popular adhesion to the dominant political parties until 1989. Final word about the Caracaso. Refusing to accept at face value, then, the political myth mythology of the Caracaso, the 1989 revolt and subsequent massacre that shattered the Democratic Fourth Republic, Belasco instead probes deeply the roots, miscued, miscues, and lived experience of those days. By attending carefully to a wide range of voices and sources, and working hour by hour through the city being torn apart, he persuasively uh, deconstructs accounts that see the Caracaso as a revolutionary gesture or an anomaly, showing how it grew out of earlier patterns of protest and repression, but with the state overwhelmed and radicalized by the crisis, produced a fundamental rupture a violent rupture with the past. It is in the context of this rupture and with the tools forged in previous struggles that n new popular movements uh, would come to shape, resist, and transform Chavismo, underscoring the depth of prior political experiences and continuing autonomy, even in the neighborhood 
which is seen as the purest bastion of Chavismo and where Chavis, Chavez would ultimately come to be buried. In short, Velasco has reopened the musty and understudied world of Venezuelan politics between 1958 and 1998, revealing its vitality and contradiction while posing some fundamental questions that scholars will now scramble to try to answer. The measure of this work will not only be in the deserved praise it is certain to win, but in the dozens of new questions and studies it will inspire. Thank you. Great. Thank, thanks a lot, Mark. And now we'll hear from Julie Skarsky. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I feel like I'm, I, I'm inspired just as you said. People would be. I've been inspired by reading this book to uh, actually look again at, at, at um, you know, periods and processes that I'd already found just as, as they've been treated by many people in the standard literature, it's just incredibly, um, they, they haven't gone anywhere. And so I really uh, am very grateful to Alejandro's book for uh, providing us together with, as you said, uh, not only an, an example of a very good social history and, and a certain, with a certain kind of focus, uh, but also of uh, um, making us, or those of us, uh, in particular those of us interested in Venezuela, uh, look at things that seem very familiar now in a very different way. And I think that, among other things, is, is, a, is a very great achievement. Um, some of the things I was going to say have, have been said, and, and I, I, I'd like to focus on a few others. Uh, I, I did want to um, say how also refreshing it is to hear what uh, Alejandro said at the beginning about how scholarship that once uh, kept portraying Venezuela as, as, as exceptional in its uh, successful democratic processes and didn't really analyze how those worked and certainly didn't recognize how I exclusionary and stifling uh, they were. Now we're doing kind of the reverse towards uh, the subsequent regime and I think that that's, that's a very uh, helpful way of, of uh, casting things. And there, there are many examples in the book of um, historical uh, processes or events that now in the current discussion are totally obliterated. Uh, for instance, the, the exclusionary kind of partisanship that uh, in one instance I think um, Alejandro mentions uh, where the president uh, Romulo Betancourt then uh, eliminated from many uh, state jobs people who were affiliated with parties who weren't in their pacted agreement. Uh, 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 leftist parties. And of course now the, the Chavez regime has been uh, over and over in, uh, accused of being uh, partisan and exclusionary, but there's, there's no recognition of the ways that many of those kinds of practices have existed, have existed before. And that's only just one of any number of things one could, one could mention. I do want to say it's it's an exciting book to read, and I don't think you can say that about that many academic <laughs> books. Um, and you know, it looks at dramatic moments. Of course, it, its focus is protest, uh, and dramatic moments also of uh, repression and uh, organizing that actually change the shape and the image and the social fabric of uh, this gigantic housing project that then became more than a housing project with the building of the ranchos, uh, the 23 de Enero. Uh, but I, I think it's also an exciting book uh, because it challenges, as, as I, other speakers have already said, uh, much of the established literature on Venezuelan history, politics, and social movements. And it also contributes in substantial ways uh, to the growing literature on uh, urban social movements in history in Latin America. Uh, refusing to be constrained by the narrow institutional focus on parties and elections that long prevailed in the study of Venezuela, uh, with its equation between electoral politics and democracy, uh, Alejandro's book boldly argues for an expanded and expansive view of democracy, 
one that views protests and local claims, both regular and irregular, uh, made on the state as constitutive elements in the formation of a more uh, participatory democratic process. He places collective actions organized within and on behalf of a uh, geographically located community as part of a larger dynamic, one that can be seen from the perspective of different scales. Uh, going all the way from up close, I mean, sometimes we're in the hallway of a building or inside somebody's apartment, um, and uh, we can see through, they tell us what they saw through their windows, and uh, all the way up to the vantage point of the president or of military officers, or in, in one case, perhaps, with, uh, with Nixon's uh, disastrous visit, <laughs> State Department views of what was going on there. Um, Alejandro's focus is on an area of Caracas that became known for its combativeness, among other things, all over the city and the nation. So while he keeps his focus on that area, he's concerned with the dynamic of ongoing change and transformation between uh, the 23 de Enero, which it's really important to, um, to note, which he sees as heterogeneous, and he always reminds us of that and the dynamic between the 23 and the state, which he sees in terms of multiple agencies, branches, and parties. Uh, so he's careful to remind us that neither one of them, the 23 or the state, is a single thing or actor, even though at certain moments they are represented abstractly as if they were unified agents having essential characteristics. Uh, so this is what I'd like to focus on in my brief comments, the dynamic uh, and the interplay in this particular space between differing social and state actors through which they are formed and changed. By placing the 23 de enero and the state within a unified field of analysis, and by viewing that field from the perspective of the residents and activists of the 23, Alejandro's study helps us understand how these actors and institutions which may appear to be fixed and independent of each other, are actually intertwined in processes through which they are mutually constituted. This framework, with its focus on activism, shows us dimensions of democracy that are made invisible by studies that take the state for granted as a thing and that view political processes in terms of politics understood in the narrow sense. Um, present company excluded, of course. <laughs> From the, from the top-down view of those kinds of studies, urban working sectors tend to be represented in terms of co-optation and patronage politics, uh, or in terms of disorder and threat, thus mirroring in many ways the state's discourse. Um, I'd like to bring out in particular the dimension of space uh, in this book and its central importance. For the history that Alejandro analyzes takes place in and is shaped by a space having specific material and social characteristics, ones that are made and remade through human actions. The history of activism he looks at unfolds as part of this material placemaking and political subject making. His book helps us think theoretically in located and historical terms about issues of political subject formation, power, and agency. This is an important contribution particularly as his approach allows his study to be open-ended, attentive to contingency, realignment, and indeterminacy. There is no foregone endpoint or goal towards which this history is headed. I see the work of Henri Lefebvre in the production of Space, of Doreen Massey in the book Space, Place, and Gender, and of Fernando Coronil in The Magical State, as all arguing for the importance of understanding history as taking place in spaces, with space seen not as a passive container of temporal events, but as a material element in the making of these events and of their representation. Lefebvre asks how nature is made into, quote, nature, through human practices, and how it enters into the social construction of space, including through representations and everyday practices and Alejandro is, does wonderful things with looking at everyday practices in this space. Uh, Massey conceptualizes space as constructed out of the simultaneous coexistence of social interrela interrelations and interactions at all spatial scales, from the most local level to the most global. 
Thus she brings space into politics as an element in the dynamic of change with an element as well of freedom. Coronil, who is concerned with the Venezuelan state as well as with states of uh, primary product exporting nations more generally, asks how the formation of the state as a landowner and export rent collector within a global market helps constitute state projects, institutions, and public performances. Through Alejandro's careful analysis of El 23 de Enero, from its formative stage when it was the Do de Siembre public housing project, and I think it's so interesting that dates are what was used and not the names of heroes. Now, that'd be an interesting thing to, to talk about. So when it was the Do de Diciembre, uh, created by the dictator Perez Jimenez, through its different confirmations as El 23, when it was at times idealized, romanticized, other times, unfortunately, more frequent, uh, feared and stigmatized, shows us how subjects have been formed and political products, projects have been contested through the medium of this particular space. Alejandro does not claim, as he said, that El 23 represents Venezuelan housing projects or Venezuelan urban activism. He's careful to delineate how its location close to the center of state power, its visibility, its changing political symbolism, and the unique process of its construction and occupation all make it a distinctive place within which new forms of collective subjectivity have been made. Um, in this contentious geography of power and struggle over the politics of space, the material features of this space have, have been important, from the hilly terrain and ravines to, the, to their remaking by massive high rises and uh, by the spreading ranchos which followed. Uh, Perez Jimenez constructed as part of his project of carrying out, quote, the rational transformation of the physical environment. This was one of his slogans. Uh, at the same time, it was an effort on his part to remake lower class subjects who were seen as backward and uncivilized into modern disciplined working class subjects. At his orders, the existing barrios were raised and the modern housing project entailed flattening the hillside and placing giant high rises in militaristic formation in disregard for the shape of the terrain, a material expression of the domination of nature. It was a direct effort to expunge signs of autonomous sociability by reforming social subjects and subordinating them violently to the state, including repressive rules of behavior for those who were to inhabit it. Alejandro analyzes vividly how, with the overthrow of Pere Jimenez, people organized themselves to occupy and claim the remaining apartments. In the process, and through their continuing struggles to obtain services, they themselves emerged as new organized social actors, new members of El 23 de Enero, but with internal differences. People's representations of the East and the West sectors, which were occupied under contrasting political conditions, became place reference that condensed narratives of history. These representations have become part of the history of these spaces, forms of identification and memory that help shape the subjectivities of the residents. Another dimension of the politics of space is that the state was the landowner and the landlord. The newly active residents of, of El 23, now able to make demands within the democratic system, address themselves to the Petro state, collector of rents from international exports, which as Coronil analyzes, was itself undergoing deep changes during this initial period. After Perez Jimenez's passive relationship to oil companies, the democratic state took an active role in redefining relations with international oil companies so as to increase oil income and state autonomy. These dimensions of power were in certain ways invisible to residents of El 23, but they were to define the state's projects, priorities, and capacities. I wonder in what ways the increasing political institutionalization and financial strength of the Petro state affected the understandings and uh, sense of rightful claims that residents of El 23 made upon the state, and the changes that the forms of this claim making underwent over the, uh, the course of the decades of boom and crisis uh, that he analyzes uh, in the book. Carefully integrating oral history, media, and political representations and documentary records, Alejandro shows us the emergence within the 23 of different kinds of activist organizations 
that adopted widely contrasting ideologies as well as tactics, some of which, as, as have been mentioned, really didn't work. <laughs> um, and, and he also shows how then uh, people made changes, made what they saw initially as compromises and concessions, and became far more effective. Um, as uh, El 23 was subject to, uh, with time, to growing state neglect and the object of expanding state violence, the decline and even self-destruction of some activist groups, especially during the Petro boom period of the 70s, when from a middle class perspective there was an abundance of wealth, um, is this especially striking. This was the period when the flow of oil rents and of imported goods, along with a hyperinflated image of Venezuela's future as an industrial producer, created perhaps the greatest set of contradictions between reality and promise uh, possibilities for those living in, in El 23. Notably, this was also the period of greatest incoherence and unhinged radicalism among activists in El 23. This, of course, contributed then to its stigmatization at the, at the national level. And having lived in Caracas during that period, I, I must say that was the generally circulating image. <laughs> Finally, Alejandro shows us how narratives about and images of El 23 became material factors in its history. Nowhere is this more brutally apparent than when the military directed a general assault on its population during the Caracaso in 1989 on the basis of a security plan that dated from the guerrilla period of the 60s when El 23 had been designated as a site of threat to the state. Uh, I, as has already been said, but I, I really wanted to underline, I especially appreciate his focus on the Caracas, so the experience of, of people, uh, they're, they're trying to figure, the ways they tried to figure out what was happening and their forms of, of participation for it. As it's been said, it has been made and was made very quickly, well, first right after it, uh, any kind of um, commemoration of, of the dead or any such thing was really prohibited and, and silenced. Uh, by the government then in power. And then since then, it was quickly made into a very abstract icon. Either uh, for some, it, it, it continues to be uh, an event which confirms their belief in the underlying savagery and barbarism of the people. Uh, for others, and within Chavista official discourse at least, it, it became the emergence of the, the uh, newly heroic and bravo uh, pueblo. And so I can think of a uh, few things more important than, than to help uh, take that apart, not just in a sense of deconstructing it, but placing it within its social location. There's so much more that, that can be discussed about this book, but I'll stop here. And, and uh, once again, thank you, Alejandro. Thank you. I haven't read the book yet. I'm hoping to. It's in my list, and um, I'm very curious about um, about you know the topic of housing in particularly because it's not being talked about. And, and and I was curious about class mm -hmm. because um, you know I think that you're talking about two disparate housing projects, right? There's the there's the the informal and formal, which kind of hints to a kind of class uh, distinction going on, <coughs> and I wonder. Um, if you could speak about class as a variable and, all of, and, and also particularly around organizing. Um, as you know, I'm doing some work on new middle classes and I'm very curious about that construct to the extent to which you know, there's such a thing as a new middle class. Um, and there's a lot of discussion around class and organizing in, in Venezuela. So I wonder what's your view about class playing you know, yeah. in all of this? Yeah, um, it, it, it's central but um, one of the things that I try to do in the book is um, uh, lay out that um, the, the social geography of the neighborhood, um, and Julie alluded to it a little bit. Um, it's very much marked by how the various sectors of the neighborhood came to be populated, and that also has an impact on how, the, not only how um, those sectors then uh, 
uh, related to the state in terms of the the political alignment, um, but also how they self-imagine along, for instance, class lines. And so I'll just give you an example. Um, the eastern part of the neighborhood, um, which was uh, uh, built and um, adjudicated under the dictatorship of Pedro Jimenez, um, subsequent studies, social, I mean, sociological studies, found that uh, in terms of the variation of income in those um, in those uh, areas, they were solidly working class people who were being moved from squatter settlements elsewhere in Caracas or nearby where these buildings were being um, were being uh, raised. Um, and yet, but the variation in terms of income was very low. There were income standards, um, and there was uh, clarity in terms of the larger modernizing project to make sure that there wasn't a significant amount of cross-class variation, right? And this was distinct, for instance, from uh, housing projects in the United States that, at the time, which were imagined as mixed income um, housing uh, you know, solutions for, um, for, for, for urban um, inequality. The Western half, which was occupied 3,000 apartments, in two days' time, after the overthrow of Perez Jimenez on January 23rd and January 24th of 1958, it was a grab bag. People from uh, you know, the eastern part of Caracas, the wealthier part, people from the, who had nothing, from who had just arrived from the interior, um, people from other parts of the 23 Enero, the, the neighborhood, um, they just rapidly descended on 3,000 apartments and took them over. Um, and so the same subsequent um, sociological sort of the surveys that were done showed a tremendous range in terms of income where you had people who were very solidly upper middle class who had other housing elsewhere in Caracas who were using those apartments as rent income, right? Living in the same building, sometimes in the same floor, with people who had basically just happened upon this chaotic scene, who had nothing, literally zinc roofs, right, and zinc, um, um, and they were coexisting in the same place. So the western half is much more heterogeneous in terms of class, and then you have the squatter settlements, um, whose own trajectory is quite riven insofar as some emerge very. Uh, right around that same time, once all those apartments were taken over, um, people just started building ranchos in the same places where they had previously existed but been removed forcibly by the dictatorship, right? Um, and so in those cases, you have um, a situation where people were very much of uh, you know, lower uh, working class um, and seeking some sort of um, uh, some foothold in Caracas, um, but reproducing the same logics and dynamics that had anchored previous, especially uh, uh, migrants from the countryside into Caracas, into the urban, um, into the urban center. Um, but that's very different from those who came in the 1970s. And those who came in the 1970s were actually far poorer than those who came in the 1960s. Uh, this was a time in, in Minnesota where the countryside was being completely devastated in terms of uh, uh, resources, right? And so you have some squatter settlements which were destitute and some that eventually grew into, you know, where I lived in the neighborhood for a year while I was doing my field work, it was, it's here in Barrio Sucre. This was a house that was uh, built in the early 1960s as a, as a shack, and now it's a four-story, you know, completely uh, integrated, you know, uh, sewage, gas, electricity, uh, water, um, that uh, residents from the overlooking uh, superblocks who used to throw stones to those residents to prevent them from building the ranchos because even though they had come from ranchos, sorry, I'm getting excited about it. Even though they had come from ranchos, they had internalized the logic of the dictatorship and saying like, no, we are moving to these super blocks to better ourselves and what you're doing is actually you know, taking us back. Um, now they say, I wish I had taken over some of those lots so that I could now have four story houses like they do, right? Um, and so there's this, you know, this also then, to your second question, creates tremendous internal fissures in terms of how um, the various sectors of the neighborhood align. With one key exception, and this is, I talk about this in the, in, in the chapter in the, in the late 1960s, the one institution in the neighborhood that cuts across income, class, uh, in class origin, um, geographic space is the high school. So there are 
you know, middle schools and there are elementary schools that service various parts of the neighborhood, but it's in the single high school, um, the, uh, the um, uh, Palacios uh, High School, that's centrally located within the neighborhood where all, very, all, the, all the various sectors coincide. And this is also the place where in the 1960s and 1970s, it's used as a place of ideological kind of um, training in the protests that happen, especially as Dorothy was mentioning, uh, to demand accountability from the state, especially in the period of the, the boom years of the 1970s. And the repression by the state to those protests by students is what helps to cohere a sense of, despite our differences in El 23, we imagine ourselves as residents of El 23. It's the moment when people start stop saying, they, they recount, I'm from Bloque 23, or that was a bad example, I'm from Bloque 7, and now I'm from El 23. It, you can sort of sense that in the self-narrative, sort of the self-identity of um, uh, of people as they move through the high school. This is the place where those um, uh, you know fissures are are cemented. So, in terms of your own work, you know, Arlene, it would be interesting to see how those places that are otherwise heterogeneous in, in these various registers, um, how, where there are institutions, local institutions, where some of those differences are flattened. Right, and then how they revert um, back on the way that social um, and political identities are forged in the context of mobilizing strategies and tactics such as the ones that I describe in the book. Other questions? I was struck by the fact that one of the photos you showed is a picture that you yourself took. I, I double checked uh, yeah. um, where you have the member of the Arm Collectivo right, who's standing on the roof. And um, I was wondering if you could talk, you know, how did that photo happen? Like, were you in conversation with him? You showed up on the roof as well. And, and, and just, you know, my general sense, you do, I, are about half the photos yours in the book, would you say? Um, yeah. So how did you kind of integrate? Um, how did you figure out how to integrate, let's say, your, your interviews with the more scholarly, um, as it were, tone of, of, of the book? How did you strike that balance? Yeah, no, that's great. You know, this, this, uh, <laughs> this was an intense day. <laughs> um, uh, you know, at the, at the time, I was, I was younger, I had no children. Um, <laughs> And just thinking back upon what you know now, are, I definitely see as risks. Um, I ask myself if I would have made similar decisions, you know. And this this one in particular was a difficult day. Um, so this is a colectivo known as Alexis Vive. It's um, in a, what's called the Zona Central of the 23 Enero. And this particular image. Um, this uh, this uh, this person from this member of the colectivo, he's standing on the rooftop of um, one of the super blocks that became famous or rather infamous in the Caracaso um, as being because it overlooks the um, the Central Avenue below. It's one of the sites of most intense repression um, from uh, from tanks stationed below. So the entire facade of this, um, uh, especially the corner of this building where he's standing, was riddled with 50 caliber bullets that if you think about the firepower of re piercing reinforced concrete in a way that makes it look like a colander, gives you a sense of the intensity of the violence that even today, and this is an image in the, in the back of the book, you can still see its scars. So the scars that are inscribed on the environment, the built environment and the physical environment are very much reflective of psychological scars. I don't want to get too much into it, but the, 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 the intensity by which people remember that, right? Um, this also, to Dorothy's point, helps structure how, for instance, in the context of you know, repression of the Chavista government uh, against um, opposition, they understand repression in a very different way. They understand it as the scars that we still see on our building. That's repression, right? Not tear gas. Um, uh, anyway, so that's it. But this day, I was trying to get um, uh, an interview with this colectivo, um, and I had made strong contacts with another um, um, armed colectivo called uh, La Piedrita. And they have sort of alliances with, with this colectivo, which operates in, a, in another sector. And so finally, they said, great, you can go interview them. 
Um, and so uh, they said, you have to show up at 9 a.m. Um, and we're going to be doing a little um, uh, demonstration in support of one of our fallen comrades who had been killed by a drug dealer um, the day before. So I show up in the morning and go to, you know, go, go to this place. So I tell them who, who I am. And they're like, all right, just, um, just, just, just follow us as, as, as we proceed. And then at, he turns around. And the, the second he turns around, he, he puts this thing over his head. And then they all do that. They, they mask themselves. And at this point, I'm thinking, this is not where I need to be right now. Um, uh, and so they were seeing this as a show of force. So they were basically, they unshield, they unsheathed their weapons and they were walking around the neighborhood, um, uh, this part of the neighborhood, as a show of force against the drug elements um, that they were combating at the time. And so then that was over and then they went up to the roof um, and said, hey, do you want to you know, come up to, to the roof? And of course, at that point, th I'm not going to say no to anything that they say. Um, and I said, this is great. We'll do it. Um, and the roofs are an important part of the story because going back to the 1960s period of guerrilla war, it's a moment when the guerrillas understand the neighborhood as a tactical advantage over the state. The roofs have a tremendous advantage when engaging troops below. Um, and the entire neighborhood actually, is, even though it's designed by a military dictatorship, it takes on the aura of being a tremendous bastion of counter of, of insurgency. Um, the interior, the uh, stairwells are set back from the, um, uh, fr they're not exposed. So it's very easy to move up and down. It's very hard for the police and the military to enter. Um, uh, once you get up to the top of these roofs, you can move from stairwell to stairwell very easily. Um, you can also, as they used to do, just throw up flyers and then the wind would grab them and then they would go through all of Caracas Valley. Right? Um, and so the roofs have a very particular resonance in the memory of people that then imagine themselves in that tr in that tradition, sort of the, the urban guerrilla revolutionary tradition. Um, but yeah, that day was was very intense. How how it wove those stories, um, uh, the, the the narrative mostly is 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 about as Mark was saying, um, you know, about this period between the 1950s and the and the 1990s. Um, I gesture towards the present, and at least the present of the the, the research period, especially in the in the conclusion. Um, but the ways in which those relationships were strongest was in, uh, especially at the time when I was there in 2004 and 2005, in granting credibility to the project as somebody who's interested in the neighborhood and the history of the neighborhood and the history of Venezuela was not passing. This was a time in Venezuela when there was a lot of revolutionary tourism, right? when people would go to Venezuela for a week or two to see like the virtues of the Bolivarian revolution. Um, and then they would come back and you know, talk about it with their friends and the rest of it. Not only was I from Venezuela and from the eastern part of Venezuela, which is the wealthier part of, of Caracas, or the eastern part of Caracas was the wealthier part, but I was because I was coming from the U.S., I was seen as a cur curiosity. As you must be one of these tourists who's like coming to slum it out for a little bit, right? Um, in this revolutionary neighborhood, when I was there for three weeks, for four weeks, for a month and a half, for two months, the story was different. And the kinds of stories that they would tell me were different. And the kinds of questions that I would begin to ask were different. Um, and that's the work of oral history. The work of oral history is not the work of surveys. It's not the work of interviews. The work of oral history is the work of relationships. You establish relationships so that you can ask questions that are difficult, not so that you can align yourself with a particular position. My um, undergraduate mentor, who's an oral historian, Deborah Levinson at Boston College, she works in Guatemala, she taught me this early on in my career. She said, to the question, does becoming too close to your subjects then make it difficult for you to tell a story that is that might be difficult for them to read? She said, the opposite is true, right? Becoming close to your subjects is actually what allows you to develop a complex narrative because this is the, this is the grounds on which that relationship's been established. And that's what happened in the book. Um, uh, these relationships were the entry point to be able to ask difficult questions that then gave a, lot, a much l more multi-layered history of the neighborhood possible. I wonder if I could follow up on that and um, ask you uh, if you can remember an example of 
what you thought your question was and then what it became when you had deepened your mm. relationships. Yeah. I, I want to take this opportunity, though, to thank Suzanne Wofford, my dean at Gallatin, who I also thank in, the, in my acknowledgments, but the tremendous support that you gave in the um, in, in crucial moments of finishing the the book was uh, was instrumental. So thank you for that. Um, yes. So I'll give you this this one example. Mao, um, the jefe civil, um, who was an urban guerrilla back when there were no urban guerrillas in the late eighties and the late seventies, early eighties, when he was just um, 13, 14 years old. Um, he uh, uh, he was the one who was installed as jefe civil, and so um, you know we scheduled an interview. Um, with I scheduled an interview with him and went to his office, um, and uh, you know we we talked for three hours about his 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 life and his experience um, in in the neighborhood over the, over the course of, of of thirty years, forty years, which all of him he, he lived there, and at the end of the interview, he said, so. You're interested in doing a history of the event de And I said, yes, this is this is what I'm doing. This is why I was just here for three hours. Um, he said, well, if you really want to do a history of the event de Sanera that captures all of it, you have to interview Manuel. And Manuel was his immediate predecessor as jefe civil. And the reason why this was completely striking to me, and this is a real turning point in my thinking, was because even though Mao is this you know, Maoist hyper lefty <laughs> revolutionary, Manuel, his immediate predecessor, is a right wing supporter of the Primera Justicia Party, who was the previous Efe Civil in the neighborhood. And he said, You have to interview him because he represents a strand of politics in the neighborhood that is just as important as the strand that I represent. And this was completely, this ca caught me off guard. My expectation was that there was going to be this completely ideological narrative about the, the bastion of the revolution, a revolutionary parish, where everyone is always already revolutionary. Um, and instead, he was sending me to, uh, to, this, to this person. And it turns out that in the early 1980s, during a uh, center, uh, a, a, a Christian democratic government, um, Mao, as a young um, uh, firebrand, had established a very close relationship with the Jefa Civil, who was a Christian Democrat, whose secretary was Manuel Mir, and they were of the same age. So even though Manuel's trajectory was in sort of Christian Democratic right-wing politics, and Mao's trajectory was in left-wing revolutionary politics, because they coincided in their activism on behalf of the neighborhood, they could see each other as um, uh, not as political adversaries, but rather as, as partners. And in fact, in the following period of the Jefatura Civil, they were co-Jefe Civil. Um, so this, you know, this is, if, if you th think about the neighborhood from the standpoint of the opposition, this is completely ridiculous. How does this happen? Because it's all, they're all, you know, hyper Chavistas. If you think about it from the standpoint of the ideological Chavista, it's like, how does this happen? They're all hyper revolutionary, right? Um, but in fact, it happens because this, the history of your neighborhood is marked by these kinds of interactions. I actually have a similar question about process. So for those of us who are not oral historians, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how you decide of all the many people you talk to when you live in a place for so long, all the many interviews or interactions you have, what to include and what to exclude, and in particular, whether there's anything that stands out for you as an example of something that you excluded and why why you made that choice. Yeah. Same day. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so the head of the Colectivo Alexis Vive is a is a guy by the name of Robert Luongo, um, who must be in his late thirties, early forties, but also has this kind of you know radical revolutionary past in the neighborhood. Um, and because they were in this moment of tremendous tension with you know local um, local gang uh, uh, drug gangs, um, they were what we call in Venezuela enconchados. They were sort of like. Aside from the show of force, they were sort of retreating into their their home base, and the home base happened to be his apartment. Um, so, um, so after this this picture, they invited me back to to his apartment, where you know I entered and there were guns everywhere, um, and you know this was 
not out of context for the moment, but it was certainly out of context for any interview that I had been doing. Um, so, um, so none of what emerged there I included in the book because those were not questions that I felt were um, you got at any kind of richness or depth that um, that I saw as a benchmark for establishing um, a, a, a rapport that went beyond the, the conventional story. But he did say something that was fascinating and is informing um, a, a next project that I have going on. He is a, a very dark-skinned Venezuela, Venezuelan. He's very dark-skinned. And in Venezuela, as in many other parts of Latin America, racism doesn't exist. Um, because we're all mixed and histories of race mixture and mestizaje and yada yada, right? But in terms of the way in which class and, and, and color in particular coincide, um, you know, there, there's certainly uh, direct connections there to be made. So he's, he's visibly dark skinned and he self identifies as Afro Venezuelan. And I was asking him a question about, you know, so how was it that you became politically conscious? How did you become, you know, how did you start um, thinking about, you know, larger political questions? He said, well, you know, in the in the 80s, as a student in the Manuel Palacio Fajardo High School, um, and we were duking it out with the police and and, and the rest of it, um, you know, I was I was reading stuff from like Stokely Carmichael. I was like listening to hip hop coming from New York. Um, and they were talking about, you know, fight the power and, you know, uh, you know, black hip hop and the rest of it. And I felt myself identified with that, not on the basis of ideology necessarily, but on the basis of a, of a racial consciousness that was emerging in me. Um, and so this idea of how race came to shape a political ideology that eventually uh, you know, was encased within this larger panoply of a Bolivarian revolutionary project that very much raises the issue of um, uh, of race in Venezuela in ways that previous governments hadn't done before. I saw a synergy there that because I was so frightened by the guns, <laughs> I didn't pursue. Um, and because I didn't know where that was going to go. So, um, so, so, you know, so that's an example of how sort of the conditions created an exclusion that now would, you know, love to, to go back and pursue. But just briefly on their first point, you know, the first part, the, f the first few months that I was there was just basically getting a lay of the land, literally, right? And once I had sort of a larger sense of the, the stories from the various neighborhoods and how riven this, this neighborhood actually is, I approached it more systematically. Right, so I definitely wanted to make sure that I could interview multiple people from various th various sectors of the neighborhood, um, from super blocks and from squatter settlements, from the eastern, from the western side, those who had been there under Perez Jimenez, those who moved in after you know the initial um, you know occupation of the western parts, um, you know those who had moved into squatter settlements in the 1950s, in the 1960s versus those who moved in the 1970s, um, uh, and it was through that process of creating a broad uh, a broad sense of representation across the, the various um, areas of the Vintresanero that more and more of this um, ribbon kind of landscape, both um, uh, literally and then conceptually, really emerged. Um, but that took a while just to be able to map the, the landscape before then I approached it more systematically. Uh, Andy? Um, I've been pulling back this question because it will be easily answered when I read the book. But <laughs> did you make any attempts, or could you make any attempts, to incorporate the drug gangs as part of your history? Yeah. And so that must have been dicey. <laughs> that was dicey. Um, and, and this gives me an opportunity for, for a second anecdote, which is, um, so uh, my parents were both in Venezuela, as um, Mark mentioned. Uh, or Jane mentioned, um, they grew up in the 1970s period. Or they, their image of the 23 is exactly as you were. This was a candela. Like, this is this is a place you don't go to if you're from this part of town. And so they lived in constant fear that I was going to die. Um, so uh, the worst <laughs> thing that ever happened to me in the neighborhood was um, that my phone was stolen. But it was stolen in a very clumsy way. I had been doing an interview in Bloque Siete, um, and I got up after the interview was done and then walked back to, um, to, to the house where I lived. And then I remembered that I left my phone. I went back to it, and the phone was gone. 
So of course what you do when your phone is gone is you call it. So I called it and um, uh, the guy who answered said, Está secuestrado, meaning it's kidnapped, but basically what he meant is the phone is, is I'm, I've like taken over your phone, but his response was, that's like which was great, actually, because now it meant that I could negotiate to get my phone back. Um, and I really needed the phone because I had a bunch of contacts there that I hadn't saved. This was 2004. Technology was much different than it is today. Anyway, there wasn't the cloud, apparently. So, um, but, so I really needed my phone back. Um, and so we started going back and forth. And every time I would call and he would hang up because he didn't agree with the price that I'd given him, he would, whenever he would answer the phone, he would say, Um This was uh, August 22nd of 2005. The only reason why you need to know this date is because my birthday is August 23rd, 1978. And so people started calling me to wish me happy birthday <laughs> as I was negotiating with this guy to get my phone back. And every time he would answer the phone, he would say, Está secuestrado. <laughs> um, and so when my parents called to wish me a happy birthday, and he answers, Está secuestrado, this was all of their worst nightmares come true. Um, and it didn't cross my mind during this whole period of negotiation to call them to say everything is fine. Um, so eventually once I did, it was many, many weeks before they would even talk to me, right? Um, my parents. But the other people who would not talk to me, because after I negotiated a price and the following day, um, uh, I, I, I gave the guy the money um, and as a good ethnographer or historian would do, I told him what I was doing in the neighborhood and I established a little bit of a relationship that eventually I was able to get a couple of interviews out of. But um, <laughs> here's the reason why I didn't pursue that. The people who would not talk to me after I told them randomly of what had happened were the colectivos because they see these criminal elements as their mortal enemies, literally. Right, And so in me paying a fee for getting my phone back, they saw this as a violation um, of what their whole sort of raison d'etre was. And so it was a really difficult time to get um, back in the good graces, as it were, of these colectivos. Um, on the other hand, I mean, the history of the of the of the criminal gangs is refracted through the history of the colectivos, and in the in the book um, I recount, especially through um, through uh, uh, police statistics of the 1970s, how it is that the drug trade emerges in the neighborhood, and through their stories, because they're very frank about how they tactically engage these people, um, that other side emerges, but it's not as direct as certainly it is with, with the colectivos, but yeah. Mm -hmm.